Hello, and uh, welcome to our first ever live chat with the Project Feeder Watch team here on the Cornell Bird Cams. I'm Charles Eldermeyer, project leader for the Cams, and today we're going to be learning about the science behind your feeder birds and answering your questions with help from two people on Project Feeder Watch, Emma Gregg and Chelsea Benson. Emma, over here on your right, <laughs> is the project leader of Feeder Watch and has been studying bird behavior and ecology for about 10 years first in Australia of all places on ferry runs, which sounds awesome, then in the Sonoran Desert on Verdun, and now through the windows of feeder watchers, just like you, across the country. Uh, Chelsea is the project assistant for two different citizen science projects here at the Cornell Lab, Project Feeder Watch and Project Nest Watch. And she answers thousands of questions a year about backyard birds, bird feeders, nest boxes, and the nesting cycle. And before coming to the Cornell Lab, Chelsea ran an environmental center in New York State's Hudson Valley. So we truly are sitting here with two, uh, we couldn't ask for two better people to start answering a variety of questions from our viewers, because our viewers, if we know one thing about our viewers, it's that they have questions. So 1977, you said Project Feeder Watch began? Yeah, that's when it started. And the inspiration was that there are so many people feeding birds in their backyard. There are 50 million in the US that do it every year. Oh and so here are all these eyes watching birds anyway. It's so but awesome. Allowed, you take down a couple of notes and say what the birds are. And there you have the beginning of a citizen science effort that is now in its 31st year. Oh my gosh. And has about 20,000 people in the US and Canada participating every year. Okay. Six, I think it's six million hours of volunteer time so far, which is something like seven or eight human lifetimes have been uh, contributed by Peter Watch participants to this effort of monitoring backyard birds. It's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> it's really great. And our season is bumping up. We're going to start on this Saturday, November 11th is the start of the season. So our Peter Watch season runs from November to April every year. Um, and so the way that people can participate is they sign up either through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology or through Bird Studies Canada, and they have a really flexible schedule of counting. So you pick the days that you want to count. We ask that you pick two days in a row to watch your feeders, and the amount of time you spend watching your feeders is also up to you. So you might spend a few, you know, 15 minutes here and there throughout the day, or you might dedicate an hour or two to, to observing your feeders. Okay. Um, so you can pick two consecutive days. You could use those same, like Saturday, Sunday, every week. Or some people can only count every other week, or maybe once a month. Or maybe some people only count a few times a season. So wow. the schedule that you watch is really flexible. Um, and so when you're watching your backyard birds, we ask that you take it's the maximum number mm -hmm. for each species that you see at one given time. So that prevents you from counting you know, the same bird over and over. Because we all know chickadees and titmice, they, they land, they take a seed, they come back, they land and they leave. So if you counted, you know, that same chickadee over and over and totaled it together, you know, you might have 100 visits from that chickadee. So right. you wouldn't have 100 chickadees. Right. So we would say, you know, you would say maybe you saw two chickadees at once, and then later in the day you saw four. So that means that your tally for that species would be. But then that sounds like a, a, a nice rule of thumb that can take a little bit of the complexity out of counting birds. So I would imagine that that could probably feel like to uh, to a non-scientist, let's say, or a non-biologist, the idea that you can actually count all the birds that come to your feeders. It almost seems like a daunting thing. Yeah. Um, but it sounds like, number one, it's, it's, it's a flexible thing from Feeder Watch's point of view. You can, you can figure out what times work for you um, and that you have a great protocol in place to actually kind of simplify the counting, is that right? Yes, yeah. right. You, have, you never can overcount if you follow this protocol. Or by overcount, I mean you can never count the same birds twice. Right. That's awesome. So that's the whole point of it. And so, given that this has been going on for uh, over thirty years, um, what do you what do you point to when people say, you know, what has this project really accomplished, or what is it that you guys um, gain from involving so many different people in um, staring at their birds in their backyard? <laughs> Yeah, so, so far there have been about 30 papers that have come out using Peter Watch data on topics ranging from disease spread, house finch eye disease, a lot of folks are familiar with that, to the spread of invasive species across the country, like Eurasian collard doves, to the creeping of little Anna's hummingbirds into snowy climates in winter, following oh, wow. bird feeders. 
So these sorts of patterns, we're learning from feeder watch data because we have eyes all over the place. So you really can see what's happening over space and through time because everybody is counting in the same way. Right. And that, yeah, there's just this plethora of different topics that you can investigate using something as simple as bird counts. So it's really up to you know the biologists or the scientists or the participants to come up with the questions mm -hmm. that they want to try to address huh. with this data set. And are there are there new questions that have been sort of like percolating in the last few years that um, maybe are different than the traditional feeder watch questions that you've been trying to address? Yes, there's a, a whole new slew of them that are, are coming out because we've started now collecting behavioral data. Oh wow! Yeah, That's really fun. Yeah, I, I, I feel like folks see it. You see all the time a bird come and kick another bird off the feeder. And normally it used to be, well, you know, all you can do is count those birds. But now you can count those interactions too and keep track of who's displacing who, who tries to kick another bird off but fails. Hmm. And then a really good one that sometimes people are lucky enough to see are predation events. Oh my gosh. I know. Yeah. And they're so rare. So if you're just a biologist and you want to study what Cooper's hawks eat, well, you better get ready to dedicate your life to following <laughs> Cooper's hawks around. Yeah, right. But theater watchers in one season collected dozens of observations of Cooper hawk, Cooper's and sharp chin hawk predation events. Wow. So it, you, it only took about a year, maybe it was a year and a half. Mm -hmm of collecting behavioral data to start accumulating a really great data set on a super rare event. Well, that's so great. And probably most people with feeders aren't super excited about their birds being eaten by predators but either. they should be. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's an important biological part of being right. a bird. You know, there's always going to be, there's often a bigger bird waiting in the, waiting in the wings, so to speak. And, and I, even on our feeder watch camp here, we actually watched a, sort of been a a year and a half ago now, we saw a red-tailed hawk swoop in and grab a mink that ah. was in the garden, which was totally cool. Yeah. Um, but it was also like kind of a bummer for the yeah. mink, and you know, there was yeah, um, there's both there's two hard sides. To watch. Yeah, you so know, it's not something that not everybody likes to see, and I totally understand that perspective. But from us, it's like really cool observation, and that we're collecting a lot of data. Sure, and it's important information to learn, even if. Sometimes it's not your happiest fear watch moment. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's 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 the case. Um, and when people are entering this data, are they sending you in like notebooks mm -hmm. full of information, or you have data sheets or something? How does that work? How do you? I guess how do you get involved, and how do how do people get the data that they see to you? Right. So they can sign up through our website, which is feederwatch.org. There's a join button. So once you join, we actually mail you if you're joining for the first time, we mail you a bunch of information. I brought some of the things we send. We send oh, cool. like a like, calendar and a poster of common feeder birds for oh, Eastern great. and Western species. I love that artwork on that yeah, poster too. Yeah, it's a really, it's really beautiful good. poster. We send you a handbook with all those questions. And then at the end of the year, because you've been collecting all this important data for us, we put out a summary of the data, huh. winter bird highlights, so okay. that you really know like your counts are important to us and we go through all those observations. So once you get all that stuff, you read through it, we take all our data online. So we used to have these bubble forms that people would send to us, um, but we've had to move to online just because that technology, we can't really support it anymore at the lab. So we moved to on online data entry, which has been a real boon for us because it provides people with information back to them right away. So you can actually go through your own observations and pull data from your own backyard. Oh, that's so great. you get instant feedback about what's happening in your yard um, you can compare your stuff with, we have data from across the country that you can look at. And if you see something rare, you'll, we'll get a notification too. So Emma mm -hmm. goes through all the rare sightings and reports back to people about like, yep, you really did see that bird here. And then we can kind of promote that stuff too. That's awesome. So people usually keep track on a piece of paper, you know, at their feeder watch area. And then after their two day count, they'll go to our website and they'll enter their observations there. Cool. Um, we were talking a little bit about what it um, what it took to join mm -hmm. Feeder Watch. You just showed us the great posters and stuff. Um, is there anything else you'd sort of like, uh, I guess, when people are thinking about joining, let's say they're on the fence, what are the, are the reasons that you've heard from maybe new Feeder Watchers, old Feeder Watchers, mm -hmm. that sort of helped them make the decision whether or not they decided ultimately to, to join Project Feeder Watch? Are there, are there things like, like rewarding things that your mm -hmm. audience has really gotten out of it that the audience that's listening right now may not actually be aware of? 
Yeah, I think one of the things that we hear a lot from people who have been feeder watchers, sometimes even for just a year or two, mm -hmm. is that they just feel like they have learned so much about the birds in their backyard because we're always encouraging repeated counts. And so just by doing it, just by trying to feed or watch, you're sort of forced to get familiar with the species that you have. So you can't help but learn about them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the, the best things about the program and what really causes people to enjoy it a lot. And do you find that, do you, find that you reach a wide audience of people? Like, is this something that just sort of one kind of person tends to do? Or do you, do you have sort of, what would be a description of the kind of people that do participate in feeder watch? Well, I think it's hard to have like one description Great. because we have so such a wide variety of people that participate. Um, really, the project is for people of all ages. So I know a lot of families participate. Oh, great. So they might do it on the weekend with their kids to help learn some of their feeder visitors. Or we even have classrooms that participate at schools. We have nature centers. Um, and then, you know, people like Emma and myself that just have like a couple feeders out the window and, and just do it in our spare time. So it's really a diverse group of people. So it's hard to just have one description for a typical feeder watcher. Right on. And I mean, full disclosure, I've done feeder watch in the past and done it with my kids. So some of these questions, I, I kind of know the answer to <laughs> out there. And I, I bet our audience realizes that. But um, from, from my personal perspective, you know, it's, it's a really great thing to, uh, I think, as, as Emma said, especially, to actually just watch those birds mm -hmm. over and over again, because they are a part of just the fabric of our yards and our parks. And the more we get to know them, the more it kind of feels like this familiar, um, you know, patchwork surrounding us that we get to interact with over time. So um, I really enjoyed my time feeder watching. Um, so you guys probably get some classic questions from feeder watchers over the years, uh, or maybe even every season. <laughs> and um, you already sort of touched on one, which was how do you know you're not counting the same birds over and over? But I don't know if you want to like maybe go over that one more time. Like how do people actually know that they're not counting the same birds over and over again, or are they? Like, how does that counting work again? Yeah, oh, yeah. the number you write down is the most of each species that you see simultaneously. So if you see three cardinals one day, and then the next day, your second day of counting, you see five cardinals, do you write eight cardinals? <laughs> no, <laughs> you write five cardinals. Right. That was the most you ever saw at once, and you can't necessarily tell them apart. Yeah. So that's that's why. That's just count mm -hmm. the most that you see at any one time. And yeah. they don't necessarily have to be at the feeder. That's a misconception. Ah, okay. So yeah. they can be in your count site area, which might include if you have bird bass, if you have trees and shrubs and even feeding on the ground. So it's the area around your feeders too that you have birds because not all birds are gonna land on your feeder and eat. You often have the predatory birds that we're monitoring now and then also like tag along birds that are just there because there's it's social. There's a lot going on and they're there to see what's happening. Sure. Yeah. It's, kind of, it's kind of like, you know, you may not be into the party scene, you still kind of go to the party to a little see bit of a there, see what people are wearing, it's okay. that kind of thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what, what would be, is there an example of a species that's like a, a wallflower mm. bird that comes to mind in your, you know, I'm kind of putting you on the spot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, I feel like kinglets are often little wallflowers. They're often not actually eating at the feeders, right, but they're yeah. popping through in the shrubbery. Uh -huh. They'll take suet now and then, but okay. uh, that's a good one. And kinglets can be real puzzles for folks oh, too. They're so they're hard to identify. Totally, <laughs> a little ruby crown kinglet. Oh, you think well, that'll have a real conspicuous color patch, but they don't because they hide them. So it uh -huh. just looks like the most drab little green thing you've ever seen. But anyway, anyway, <laughs> there you go. Like hanging around. Yeah. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> well, and so you've you touched on some like really interesting sounding birds, like ruby crown kinglets, and even the, the chickadees and things that come to the feeders. But what about birds like house sparrows or just like what people think of as normal birds? Like, is it worth even counting those birds? Mm. Or like if I have a feeder that only has those birds coming to it, like is it worth joining feeder watch to tell you I have a bunch of house sparrows that just eat all my <laughs> they're frustrating pigeons, you. you know? yeah, exactly. So is that the sort of thing that feeder watch is interested in? Yeah, definitely. We want to know about those like everyday common birds are really the heart of our data set and mm -hmm. are really important. And this year, you can probably speak to it a little bit better, but there's an undergraduate student who was looking at house sparrow populations mm -hmm. and finding that, that on the whole, they're on the decline. Oh, and they're, so we're look, using feeder watch data. So we often think that house sparrows are just ubiquitous. They're everywhere. There's too many of them. 
but their populations are actually declining and we're using our data to figure out why that might be. And it's not always in the same, like it's not like a city thing, a country thing. It's sort of across the board. Mm -hmm. huh. Yeah, and that brings up a really good point. So we're showing with feeder watch data that house sparrows are in decline. That means not only is it valuable to report when you have house sparrows, but it's also valuable to report when you don't. Right. Right. You can't show a decline if you don't have an increase in the zeros right. as you go through time. So right. all of the counts are valuable. Even if you did a feeder watch and you saw no birds one day. I don't know if we've ever gotten a count like that, <laughs> but it would be totally useful. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, yeah. I can imagine if your normal count day was like during an ice storm or something and the birds were all just... Pew, you know, yeah, that, that's the that sort of thing that could happen. Yeah, um, we do ask people to record weather when they're watching to take okay. into account, you know, um, temperature, precipitation, and, and things like that. Okay. Well, and, and sort of, I think you sort of touched on this, but um, we got a question from um, via email from someone named Nan, and she was saying that she had three feeders around her house mm -hmm. that attract different birds, and she wanted to know because she told them together for mm -hmm. a single site entry. You know, would that count as an entire feeder watch area or how do, how do you take into account multiple feeder maybe locations on, a, on an individual property? I think you could still do it as long as you you know you've got three feeders you see a couple cardinals at each one if you added up those cardinals I think that would be wrong because a right. cardinal could move from one to the other right. but if you still follow the the mantra of the most I see at one time, uh -huh. then I think that would still be mm -hmm. fine to be peeking out different windows around your house. Okay. The way I like to think about it is you at the end of your count, you want to be able to say, I know for sure I have at least this many whatever species around my yard. And and if you can say that about it, then you've got it. Great. Well that's a good that's a good answer. And similarly, uh, a different person named uh, Brigitte asked us about the use of almost technology. Mm -hmm. So they have a bird, uh, a bird motion activated camera that they place oh, by their cool. feeders. <laughs> and they leave it out all day, and it and it snaps images anytime it detects movement. Right. So, can she use those images captured by her fo photo booth to do a feeder count? Can she count? Can she basically use that that observation and say that that's a feeder watch count? I think that what might be missing from that is she's not going to see any of your ground feeding birds, probably aren't going to get caught on the camera or anything outside of that one single camera. Gotcha. So I think that it probably wouldn't give us a big enough picture of what's happening at that count site. I think that technology is really great um, and maybe will help you understand like maybe the diversity of species that are visiting and if you're having trouble identifying certain birds, it yeah. will help you practice sure. identifying them. But I don't know if I would res rely on that as single piece of technology for a count. I well, think it would be mean, better to couple it with your observations. Right, yeah. and I think, you know, Emma, you had mentioned about how zeros are important. And if you can't see the ground to see the juncos foraging or something like that, that zero for your count right. would be reflecting potentially the wrong information. You'd be saying there were zero juncos, right. but there actually are juncos at your house. So that's that's a really good, that's a, I like the way you frame that in terms of it only gives you one piece of the view that we would, you would normally get from a feeder watch site. Mm -hmm. um, so Marie wrote in over email that uh, she's a 10-year participant feeder watch. Thank you, Marie. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> she says, um, sadly, this year we have found at least two goldfinches with eye disease mm. dead in our yard, and that her goldfinch numbers have been really low. But the house finches, who we know used to, or at least used to be more commonly seen with eye disease, um, seem to be healthy. And she cleans her feeders twice a week. Um, do you guys have any information about goldfinches, eye disease, whether it's on the rise, that sort of thing? Well, we know that it's starting to occur, and we have just, um, is it this year or last year, added, we added mm -hmm. monitoring um, eye disease and goldfinches to the feeder watch protocol so that we can answer that very question of, is it on the rise? It's not super prevalent yet, but I think we might have gotten that part of the data entry just in, time, in huh? just in time to be able to catch it as it starts. Wow. And it sort of makes sense what um, she's observing. House finches have already gone through the process of getting eye disease mm -hmm. and it's spread and it's right. sort of reached an equilibrium in house finches. If it's just now starting to affect goldfinches, then it makes sense that it might be really virulent 
in them, and so that may be why she's observing deaths in that species, because uh -huh. they haven't really had time to figure out how to cope with it yet. Right. That's my guess. Right. So this is an emerging, <laughs> That's right. emerging um, zoonosis that is, uh, that you guys are actually gathering data about in real time, basically mm -hmm. right now, which is really cool. Yeah. Um, I, and I, I didn't know about that. That's great. Um, we had a, a question from one person that, um, who lives in a housing association that doesn't actually allow feeders, mm -hmm. but they do allow bird baths and she has plants in her yard that attract birds. Um, would that be something that would be eligible for a feeder watch site? Yeah, definitely. Um, you don't have, I mean, it seems counterintuitive. It is feeder watch, <laughs> <laughs> but if, you know, what we're looking at is, you know, the distribution and abundance of winter birds. And so we want to know, you know, what, you can have a bird bath, you can have, you know, trees and shrubs that have fruits and seeds that they um, forage at. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you definitely don't have to have your traditional feeder That's out. Nice. You can have alternate. Um, and you know, if she's in a warm climate, she could try nectar feeders too. Often yeah. they don't attract some of the pests that people are concerned about. Um, well, and that's a great actual segue into a, a few questions from our broader CAMS audience um, mm -hmm. about about feeders in general and, and feeding birds. Sure. Sort of transitioning away from just sort of the more feeder watch specific questions yeah. and the more general questions. But um, we actually got a number of different questions about what I'll put into the category of pests or things you don't want at your feeders sure. anyway. <laughs> some of them you really don't want probably at your feeders. Some of them are just it's more of a matter of preference. But okay. um, a couple of people asked about rats. Rats as well as skunks, raccoons. Mm. We had Elizabeth on email. Um, we had um, <laughs> Liz on email, Sherry on email, asking about rats, cats, skunks, <laughs> raccoons. Um, Man, the whole gamut think, of actually, wildlife think, there. Yeah, so I think these are things that people traditionally would say we don't want really right. at our feeders yeah. at all, right? Right, right? And so is there anything, if you think about these things as nuisances, let's say, do, do you have recommendations for people when it comes to their feeders and the fact that um, they can attract uh, sure. non-desirable uh, wildlife to your yard that aren't even birds for this matter, right? right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to start this one. I'll chime in if I think of anything <laughs> yeah, to add. <laughs> um, let's see. Well, so there are different feeders that you can purchase that have baffles or deterrents built into them to try to prevent things like squirrels or heavy creatures. This also applies to large birds that sometimes folks don't want, like yeah. jays or blackbirds. Those can work as a deterrent for a lot of things like that. For stuff like raccoons and skunks and rats, um, sometimes what's attracting them is seed that's on the ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. So trying if if you really don't want those animals or well rats, I guess nobody wants rats, but right. skunks are so cool. They are. <laughs> so you get sprayed. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, be careful. Right? <laughs> um, but just keeping your feeding area tidy um, can really help with that. Making sure that where you store your seed in the garage, mm -hmm. don't just leave a plastic bag in the corner. Mm -hmm. Put it in a metal bin that creatures can't get into, and that'll help with rodents and things like that. Um, Sometimes it helps stuff. to bring your feeders in at night. So mm -hmm. if you've yeah. got some night marauders like raccoons out there, you can bring your seed in. That will help. And I know that with rats, usually we ask people to take their feeders down for a couple weeks because yeah. once they find a food source, and this can apply to a lot of other wildlife, they are going to come back to it over and yeah. over repeatedly, especially if it's always there. So if yeah. you take it, you disrupt that cycle, they find another food source somewhere else. Hopefully they've forgotten, but you never know. They might come <laughs> back. Um, but what you can also do is you can create some kind of catching system so that it's catching the seed that's falling from your feeder. Um, but, you know, you just can't have the catch system out then because then you've basically got a platform feeder created. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to put some kind of cage around it that animals can't get into. So it's catching falling seed into some kind of like cage device so that animals can't get into that right. seed on the ground. Yeah, I mean, I know that it's tricky. Yeah, it really is. And it, it requires some creative problem solving. And we have lots of tips from feeder watchers about what works. That's it awesome. doesn't work. And those are on your website? Yes, okay. we do have tips from feeder watchers on our website. Okay. Yeah. And I know for me, we've, we've had a longstanding uh, skunk, um, and they are super cute. We have <laughs> families of skunks that come to our feeders. And, and one thing that I think helped um, make them move on this year is we actually removed a lot of the 
places where they could like easily take shelter. Oh, so I put, we have like a little good idea, shed, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. that they used to be able to run under, and I just put fencing around the bottom part of that. And I think similar to birds, putting out shelter near mm -hmm. your feeder, for example, right. often can attract birds over. I think denying them that shelter maybe has helped as well. Yeah. Um, thinking specifically about squirrels, which are sort of, you know, like some people love the squirrels, some people hate them. They're not quite in the category of skunks. <laughs> Some people do love them, like Emma. Yeah. Um, but what what do you recommend people do about squirrels? How do you keep squirrels from eating in a bird feeder? Beth on Twitter, as well as um, Henry on email, both ask like, is there a kind of feeder I can buy um, or a deterrent I can use? Um, is there anything that you guys have found to be particularly effective against squirrels? Well, I think putting baffles. If you have a, if you can put a pole feeder up and put a baffle on it, whether it's a cone baffle or like a stovepipe baffle, so it should be something like on the pole. Right, but you also need to place that feeder away from an area where the squirrels can jump. Yeah. So it does no good to have a baffled feeder that's right next to a tree because right. then they just climb the tree and jump from the top. Right. So that's one way. You can purchase a feeder that has, like Emma described, a closing mechanism. So if something heavy lands on it, it closes the feeding ports mm. so that the squirrel can't actually get to them. Some people devise like ways to string their feeders um, mm -hmm. across like a long distance and then have a baffle over top. So even if the squirrel can climb the line, they often have a hard time getting around that baffle to jump down to the feeder. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of different tactics and sometimes it takes trial and error, unfortunately, to figure out what works best. Yeah, I always, for your squirrels, because it seems like everybody's squirrels have different, <laughs> right, different skill set, rating right? approaches. Yeah. yeah. And I, always, I always tell my mother who has issues with squirrels, you know, the squirrels have nothing to do all day long, like 24 hours a day, but try and devise ways right. to get to your feeders. You know? yeah, so it's like, that's true. if you want to spend that much time, you'll probably beat them eventually. But, you know, I don't think we're that motivated. Um, and Henry, I think it was actually asked specifically what we have down here on the feeder watch. Mm. Them. As I look out the window, we have both stovepipe style baffles, which are the sort of the cylindrical baffles on the poles. And then we also have um, the, what do you call those, cone baffles? Yeah, cone baffle. Yep. Above those. Mm -hmm. um, and then the biggest problem with, in the feeder wash garden is that there's a lot of trees. And so right. we cited it, you know, four years ago when this started, we cited it in a place where the squirrels couldn't get to it, but the trees continue to grow. <laughs> and um, the squirrels continue to be nice and healthy and jumping onto it from a distance. Um, so let's see. Moving on from the mammals, mm. you know, there's also what people think of as undesirable birds. You mentioned big birds. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some people will group into that big bird category, sparrows, grackles, starlings, mm -hmm. um, blackbirds. Mm -hmm. Are there strategies people can use to, um, to preferentially have different birds than those coming to their feeders or sort of like de-incentivize their feeders to those groups of birds? Yeah, a lot of those birds, sparrows and blackbirds and jays, they um, like platforms or ground feeding often. Mm -hmm. So sometimes just doing something simple like putting using tube feeders instead of something nice and flat mm -hmm. could potentially help with that. Um, what other things do people do to keep those guys I know away? For, for suet, you can buy the suet cages where there's like a roof over top and the suet blocks on the bottom. Mm -hmm. So in order to get to the suet, unlike a jay that might just sit there and hang on the side of a suet cage, they can't actually cling underneath like a nuthatch or a woodpecker could. Mm. So it's really a, a style of feeder that's meant for clinging birds that like suet as opposed to the the blackbirds and the starlings and grackles and jays and things like that. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, so like that, I, we actually had a question about what kind of suet feeder to put out there. So, so Sarah wrote in on email, and that's that's great tip. We actually <laughs> yeah. use that um, in the because in the, in the feeder watch garden we have a a suet feeder that's basically you're able to stand on a platform mm -hmm. and reach it if you're a big bird like a grackle. So sometimes mm -hmm. we have oh, grackle yeah. infestations. We'll take that down and put a hanging mm -hmm. suet feeder up there for that very reason. Um, and, the, and the starlings, or the uh, grackles have a very hard time with that. Um, I don't think we answered like the house sparrow question very well. You yeah. could switch oh, yeah. out your food source. So you could try like niger seed or mm -hmm. fruits and things like that. Um, some people have had success putting like a halo system around. So you have like a wire circle around the top of your feeder and then like streamers. Oh. You don't want to use fishing line because they could get, get tangled in it. Yeah. But usually like, like some kind of streamer or um, a thin metal with like washers at the end. Um, and some, I also had some feeder watchers write in that 
below the perches on their feeders, they were taking string and metal washers and hanging it below the perches, <laughs> and it was effective. I'm not sure yeah. the science behind why that is effective. Me neither. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so again, with the squirrels, it might take some trial and error as far as trying different foods, trying maybe like this halo, it's on our website. I think it's in the tips for feeder watchers or on our blog. Okay. You can look for, <clears throat> you know, different methods. But again, there's no one right answer, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> we wish. Well, just we're about, move. Right, just <laughs> yeah. move to a place with different birds, right? Yeah. Know. Well, we're about 40 minutes into this hour, uh, in part thanks to our technical glitches <laughs> earlier. And if we don't make it through all your questions today, we'll try and answer a few of them, uh, whatever's left on Twitter, just so everybody knows. And if you're just coming in right now, we're sitting with um, Emma Gregg and Chelsea Benson from Project Feeder Watch. And we're going through a bunch of questions from our listeners. And <laughs> I feel like I'm on the radio because we're not on video right now. but um from our cam viewers that have been sent in over the last week um so one question we got we had a couple people asking about robins mm. and that they wanted to have more robins in their yards and uh one person wrote in that they actually uh, had robins visiting their mealworm feeder cool. and they wanted to know whether or not that was common so from your point of view do robins tend to come to feeders with mealworms on them Mm -hmm. yeah, they sure do. Yep, they love fruit and insects, and it's becoming more common. Robins uh -huh. seem to be spending more, more and more robins seem to be spending their winters further and further north. Okay. Um, so, yeah, yeah, now's the time to be watching for them, and putting out mealworms or dried fruit is a great way to get them to come to your yard. Okay, so Lisa on email that wrote us in, sounds like mealworms, dried fruit, mm -hmm. fresh fruit. Sure. Do they eat fresh yeah. Okay. yeah. You could. And then even like heated bird baths are a good way to attract yeah. some uh, species yeah. that you might not consider feeder, feeder visitors. Okay. Yeah. yeah you could, could try that too. That's cool. And, and we had a question about peanut butter. Is peanut butter safe to be putting out on a feeder or putting out for birds? Yeah. yeah. It is. Yeah. Um, there have been no reports of it, you know, birds like, I think the worry is that they're going to choke because it's so sticky. If you are worried about that, you can mix a little like cornmeal in there, give it a little gritty uh -huh. texture. Um, but yeah, we haven't had any reports of it being harmful for birds. Nice. Well, here on the East Coast, we're getting close to lunchtime. And I don't know about you, but peanut butter and cornmeal. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good right now, right? Um, let's see here. Um, Couple questions about well, sticking on this dried fruit idea. Um, one one person, Brigitte, wrote in on Twitter wondering about dried fruit has a lot of dried fruit has sulfur dioxide on it, which is a, I think a preservative. Um, is there anything known about whether or not that's safe to feed to birds? Does sulfur dioxide affect them in any way? Like so many preservatives and uh, additives to food, we don't have good scientific studies saying here is the effect of different quantities of this stuff on birds. So we really don't know for sure. But that's why generally our recommendation is not to offer those sorts of foods if you can help it. That said, in tiny doses, occasionally, most of that stuff is surely harmless. But you don't, don't want to just, uh, right. yeah, so we just better to be safe and, yep. and find stuff that doesn't have that in it. Yep. If you can find an alternative, that's the best course of action. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's always, it's always amazing how much of those things wind up in the food that you think yeah. doesn't have anything in it, especially something like dried yeah. fruit. Right? Yeah. So you expect it to be fruit. It's just yeah. a raisin. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, a couple people pointed out that, um, and this kind of goes back maybe to the blue jays and the grackles and mm. things, but it could be other ones, that they have some bully birds or that they have mm. birds that are um, being mean to <laughs> other birds. And I wondered if you guys um, had any recommendations either for bully birds or maybe some insight into what they're seeing out there or? Um... Um, well, I guess in terms of <clears throat> those bully birds tend to be jays and grackles and these larger things that we sort of already talked about trying to deter. Um, I can't remember how we said to deter them, but we said something. <laughs> Different feeder options. Different yeah. feeder yeah. options, yeah. thanks, right. yeah. Um, but what they're witnessing, what they're observing, we're starting to get a better understanding of because of the behavioral interactions that uh, we're right letting people speak. submit now. Mm -hmm. And it turns out these bully birds, it's not just our misconception or an illusion. Some of these groups really are more aggressive than you would expect for their body size. Huh. So, yeah, they really are tough cookies. So is this something <laughs> coming from the data that you guys have collected? Mm -hmm. or? Yeah, okay. exactly. What was the interesting, um, like the triangle of interaction? I, that was really, yeah. So most, if you take the all of the 
um, behavioral interactions that feeder watchers collected over the past couple of years, and you say, okay, what kind of a dominance hierarchy is there across the continent? Which is amazing that we can do that. Yeah. So thank you, feeder watchers, for <laughs> collecting that data. Um, and this is all work that Elliot Miller, a postdoc here at the lab, is really spearheading. It's overall the hierarchy is linear. So there's a bird at the top and a bird at the bottom, and right. it's just a line. That bully. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there are these interesting, um, I think they're called non-linearities, every now and then where species A will be dominant to species B, species B will be dominant to species C, and then species C will be dominant to species A. Right. It's weird. It's yeah. so weird. And so there's a little hint that this might be the case between starlings, red-headed woodpeckers, and red-bellied woodpeckers. Mm -hmm. We need more data to confirm but that's a hint from the data so far. And the idea is that maybe these non-linearities help these species. I'm gonna shift gear, we have about 15 minutes left. Um, still dealing with some questions. We had some questions about um, window strikes and tips for placing feeders. So thinking about um, your activity, where you should put your mm -hmm. feeders, and then how do you stop birds from running into your windows? Um, so I don't know if you guys have any thoughts from from your end of the building about these issues? Well, I think that here at the lab, we have an, a netting over the big window near the feeders, mm -hmm. and that prevents the birds, if they do come toward the window, they'll hit the net first instead of the glass, and it softens that, and mm -hmm. then they you know, are able to, to uh, escape without casualty. Um, so if you have a window that's really problematic, then you might want to consider putting up some kind of netting or screen even yeah. leave your in That's your, what we in do your for glass the for a yeah. facing window which um, is always a bummer but yeah it's really yeah. about breaking up that reflection and so there's different things you can do i know that um, the american bird conservancy recommends some kind of like stripes mm -hmm. they've found to be mm -hmm. the most effective way to prevent window stripe strikes um and they they sell a product i'm not really sure yeah, i think it's called bird tape, bird we, tape. we actually use some of that over on campus uh mm -hmm. after some of the red-tailed hawks ran into a bus shelter mm -hmm. um over there so if you if you if you drive through the center of cornell campus you'll mm -hmm. see two bus shelters conspicuously sticking out with bird tape on oh, them oh cool in a nice pattern yeah of um, course <laughs> so yeah so so far that's been working <laughs> yeah and so it also like if your feeders are pretty close to the window that generally is i mean there's no again it's like hard to like say definite but like it generally prevents them from getting a, a lot of momentum coming uh -huh. at your window gotcha. mm -hmm. um so and then obviously if they're pretty far away it's the same thing they are far enough away that they're hopefully not going to come towards your windows so it's finding that sweet spot hopefully breaking up that reflection for your windows okay yeah, yeah. and um thinking about feeders and uh when to feed. Mm. You know, some people are really worried. Um, we have Tom and Kathy writing over email that they usually feed the birds all year, but they're going to be away for a couple of months this spring. Mm. And is there some process they should do to wean them mm. off their feeders? Or do you have any recommendations for how they should approach that or any information on what, you know, what the birds might do once that food source is gone? Well, our understanding of what we do know about how birds use feeders is that they rarely are super, super dependent on, well, they may never be super dependent on any one source of food. And if you think about it, it really makes sense for, a, for an individual to just rely on one little resource. That's totally foolhardy if you're living, especially in a temperate mm -hmm. environment where food sources are unreliable. And so lots of these birds in winter have lots of food sources and they come to your feeder, but they're going to lots of other spots as well. So you really don't have to worry too much okay. about disrupting that. It'll just be one diner is closed, but there's another diner that they're going to be able to go to and, and feed from. <laughs> so. And I mean, and don't some of these birds, they actually store food as well. So, yeah. you know, what are some of the speed, what are the, some of the birds that you might find at a feeder taking food away and storing it someplace for after that. I mean, I know I've seen chickadees, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. obviously blue jays. Are there any other species that most feeder watchers might notice carrying off food? Well, those are the those that? are the biggest. Yeah, yeah, the jays and the chickadees really like and to catch hatches. food, nut hatches. Yeah, in the bark of trees. Yeah, some, some woodpecker species. Cool. Yeah. Well, and, and sort of going off this idea of, um, you know 
not being around their feeders for a while. We have some other people writing in, like Stephen and Linda, you know, who both are writing in with a similar observation about this fall. Mm. They feel like there haven't been any yeah. birds <laughs> coming to their feeders. And um, and even they pointed out at our camp uh, here at Cornell that there haven't been that many birds coming to the feeders, it seems like, this fall. And uh, are they going to, are the birds going to come back? Like, what's going on with the birds? Do you guys have any insight into that from your data or from what you've been reading about? Yeah, do you want to start? Or? Yeah, I think this is probably like the most common question, like the lab as a whole has gotten this fall. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, in general, we say, you know, we never really know, you know, what's happening in your region with the specific birds at your feeder. Like, it's hard to be certain. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we, we offer some broad generalizations. So sometimes we say, you know, it could be a predator is nearby. So if all of a sudden a Cooper or Sharpshin hawk is hanging out at your feeders or there's a, your neighbor's cat has found your feeders, you're, you're going to see a decline in the birds visiting your feeders. Weather can impact. Um, but I think the big answer for this fall is that there's just an abundance of natural food resources out there. Huh. So there's a lot of acorns and maple seeds and, you know, hickory nuts and, you know, there's dogwoods with berries on it and crab apples. And so there's just a lot of food out there for birds this time of year, especially the fall, you know, it's really abundant. And so instead of visiting your feeders, they're foraging in the woods. Um, so that's one of the big observations. And, and then there's also like the timing of sometimes your winter feeder visitors might are have a lag between the fall or the the birds that are migrating from the fall so you might be seeing that shift in in populations and so there's a lag time between you know departures and arrivals basically gotcha. yeah. yeah and then you were reading something interesting about like the flocks and yeah because a lot of birds okay they're nesting they're paired up in the summer and they're really uniformly distributed because every right. two birds wants their own little space well those territories break down in the fall and a lot of these birds like titmice and uh, chickadees and things like that will form winter flocks. And so in autumn, they all start to glom together and move around more as a group. Mm -hmm. So imagine that you've got this just layer of bird seed that's super flat and smooth and there's a seed covering every inch of the table. And then all of a sudden the seed turns into little balls. Well, that means there are some spots with higher density, right. but there are also spots that don't have any seeds. Right. So now replace seeds with birds, yeah. <laughs> and that's what I'm trying to describe. Well, I think anybody who's gone for a walk in the woods, at least around here in the winter, has has experienced that. You know, you're walking along and it's dead quiet, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden the forest is exploding around you, and there might be like 30 birds or something. And you keep walking, and then there's no birds. Right. You know? Yeah. And so right. it's that winter flocking thing, which is a really neat um, phenomenon. And I think if people that are making the observations about no birds visiting their feeder, if you're just inside and watching your feeder, it might seem like there's absolutely zero birds around, you know, it's the yeah. apocalypse. <laughs> 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 we don't know. Bird yeah. Bird. <laughs> so, but if you go outside and you take a walk, you'll hear them, you'll mm -hmm. see them. So they're there. It's just that through, you know, your looking glass, it seems like they've disappeared. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. But it is a really great observation. It so. is, yeah. People are noticing real right. biological phenomena. So right. it's so cool. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, that's kind of what you guys are using them to do. Right. right? That's what people, yeah. the, the feeder watchers, are basically sending that information to you mm -hmm. every day, which is kind of neat. But I expect that, like, with the fall, you know, as it's colder, the, it gets harder to find those food resources, we'll see more activity sure. at, you know, feeders. Well, and, and Feeder Watch starts up soon, right? So, like, if we're thinking about if people did want to join Feeder Watch, mm -hmm. when does Feeder Watch even start? Saturday. That's right. <laughs> Saturday, Saturday. Like, five days from now, four days from now, yeah, three days right. from now. However it's many days, I don't know. Yeah, so yeah. Who knows yep. what day it is anymore? Mm -hmm. It's so Saturday, it Saturday. Um, so, you know. Theoretically, yep. If you were watching this and you wanted to participate, you could sign up. You would have to use the resources through our website. We would, mm -hmm. you wouldn't get the kit by yeah, time, Saturday. But, yeah. But you also, it's like we said at the beginning, it's really flexible. Uh -huh. So even if you sign up in a week or two, you can still participate. Every count to us matters. Absolutely. Right. If you sign up in January and count a couple of times, right. those are still super valuable, and then you can still give a little taste of it. Mm-hmm. Very flexible. So it's uh, it's amazing that it's right around the corner. I feel like this was our first cold morning here in, yeah. in, uh, in Ithaca. Frost. And um, it's a good time of year for it to start up, bring those birds back to the feeders. Um, we're just about out of time here. Um, we have one question about 
um, which I think is a good one. You probably have a lot of information on your website about this, but people are worried about how to clean their feeders mm -hmm. properly and whether there are certain um, products they should use to clean it that are healthier for the birds than others. I don't know if you guys have any feedback on that question. Yeah, um, soap and water, warm soap and water, that's fine. If you can pop your feeder in the dishwasher, some of them. Yeah, some Probably are dishwashable. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. dishwasher and, safe. <laughs> yeah, and you can use bleach. If you let it dry, the bleach evaporates completely. So as okay. long as you dry it, it's no problem. Yeah, I think the important part is that when you refill it, it's completely dry. Okay. Because you don't want any mold growing in your feeder. So, is that a danger to birds, mold? Yeah, if you, your seed gets moldy, you can certainly... Be a, yeah, be a hazard for birds. Nobody wants to eat moldy. <laughs> <laughs> Not even birds. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and I think like just paying attention to what the conditions are like, you know, if it's a really warm and humid and it's wet and, you know, then you might want to clean your feeders more frequently. If you're seeing birds with eye disease, definitely, you know, we ask people to clean your feeders, leave them down for a few days, you know, and, and yeah. make sure they're dry when you put them back out. Um, so, yeah, it's good hygiene. Yeah. It's always good. <laughs> right. well, that's good. Well, I think that's basically where we're going to wrap up for this hour. Um, I wanted to say thanks to everyone who tuned in today and sent in questions. Um, I also want to let you know that uh, the Cornell Lab has a new online course about feeder birds. And uh, it really takes a deeper look at the ID, the identification of those birds, and understanding a lot of the behaviors that Emma and Chelsea have been talking about today that you can see at bird feeders. Um, and right now, it doesn't actually go online till next week, but there is a pre-enrollment discount. Mm -hmm. Were you saying something about Feeder Watch you, you posted? Yeah, so if um, people sign up for the Feeder Birds course, they get a free Feeder Watch membership for this season. Oh, okay. And if Feeder Watchers, they've already got their membership and they still want it and they want to take the course too, then we'll extend their membership through 2018-19. Oh, great. So they'll get next year for free. So really anybody, whether you're already right. a feeder watcher or not, right. if you sign up to take the uh, online course at the... Uh, it's through Bird, Bird Academy, Academy yeah. Site. So they it's won't not necessarily feeder see it on watch, Feeder yeah. Watch, but it's on, it's on uh, the Cornell Labs Bird Academy. Right. Um, you'll get a free membership this year, or if you're already in Feeder Watch, Next a year. membership for next year, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. So you can check out the course overview at academy.allaboutbirds.org, or you can probably even just Google Cornell Lab feeder course, mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but I really want to thank Chelsea and Emma yeah, for coming out today. Fun. It's the first time we've done this with, with the Feeder Watch team, and um, I have no doubt that the questions will continue to roll in. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we get the chance sometime soon to do this again, maybe towards the end of the season. We could talk a little bit about sure. what you guys are learning. Sounds great. That'd be thanks. fun. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks to everybody out there who listened in. Sorry for the uh, technical issues. And we hope to see you all again soon. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.